So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Frey with a big round of applause. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a great honor to be here with the good people of Korea today. Um, this is a, such an unusual event, and I, I feel honored to be participating in this, even though most people aren't able to attend in person. So, so let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the things happening around the world right now. So we're a very backward-looking uh, society. We tend to look backwards on everything. And it's just human nature because we've all personally experienced the past. And when we look around us, we see evidence of the past all around us. In fact, all information we come into contact with is essentially history. So the past is very knowable, and yet we're going to be living the rest of our lives in the future. So it's almost as if we're walking backwards into the future. My job as a futurist is to help turn people around, to give them some idea of what lies ahead. So how does the future get created? Well, the future gets created in the minds of everybody around us. We all participate in creating the future. But people make decisions today based on their understanding of what the future holds. So I use this phrase quite a bit, the future creates the present. Now this is just the opposite of what most people think. Most people think that what we're doing today is somehow going to create the future, but from a little different perspective, it's these images of the future that we hold in our head determine our actions today. So here's the key thing. If we change somebody's vision of the future, we change the way they make decisions today. I'll say that again. If we change people's vision of the future, we change the way they make decisions today. So that's my goal. Before people finish watching this presentation, I will hopefully have changed their, their vision of the future and they will be making different decisions as a result of that. So COVID-19 is a very dark time in human history. But even in the darkest times of human history, people of extraordinary character have lived among us and are guiding us on a pathway to peace. So I'm going to be asking a lot of questions along the way because we don't have all the answers and sometimes the best way to figure out the future is through asking the right questions. So what, what process will people use to rise to a point of power sometime in the future? And exactly what is it that will constitute power and control in the future? So non-state actors are increasingly empowered with new technologies. So as an example, will corporate CEOs have more power and control than leaders of individual countries? These people have enormous amount of clout around the world. Will religious organizations wielding their international clout begin to usurp the authority of, of the, the host nations? Will groupings of countries such as EU, NATO, OPEC, and the UN supersede the power of, of their member states? Will non-government organizations such as the IMF and the World Bank rise in influence to overrule the decisions of individual countries? Will the economic ties of large professional organizations such as the International Chamber of Commerce with its 6.5 million members, will that transcend the authority of nations? And here's a very unique question because with social media companies, does the power to censor supersede or overshadow the power to regulate? Now these people on this, this image here are members that Facebook has selected for their new Supreme Court that will decide what's acceptable and what isn't to be put on social media. As we increase our awareness of the world, the power, uh, the nature of power and control starts to change. We are entering a period of great turmoil. While the age of heavy guns and hardware is ending, a new age of bio, cyber, and mind wars is just beginning. We are transitioning from national systems to global systems, and many people will resist these changes. 
our growing dependency on technology will mean that we face an increasing number of breaking points. More things are going to go wrong. Imminent risk and menacing danger is being reframed around non-intuitive, non-visible, and non-obvious threats. Most com countries are, are amping up their AI detection networks. These are designed around making invisible threats visible. <clears throat> Every border crossing, international terminal, and port of entry will have growing levels of sensors, videos, and audio detection, and we will see an explosion of mobile autonomous drones and other such devices to increase our awareness. Border walls will become simultaneously visible and invisible. They'll become audibly acoustic, um, digitally obvious, automatically distinct, aromatically distinct, and tactically discernible. This idea of what constitutes a border separating one group from another is going to change in its form and its substance dramatically. The goal will be that no germ, virus, bacteria, fungi, or protozoa will have the power to cross a border undetected. So in the future, we're going to have the ability to tell if specific molecules are actually crossing a border. And anyone crossing a border should expect the equivalent of a full cavity search done imperceptibly without human touch, using scanners and, uh, and swarm bots and AI detection networks. All of this will happen without us knowing it's actually taking place. And at the same time, we're going to have a lot of pushback. At the same time, with Europe taking the lead on the right to be forgotten, we will soon see similar causes driven by tech innovations like the right to be digitally invisible, the right to be physically invisible, or the right to be totally undetectable. Will we have those rights going into the future? Always remember, during great times comes great opportunity. Right now we have a world of rapidly shifting demographics. People aren't paying attention to the big demographic shifts happening right now. In a, in a big conference last year in Shanghai, Elon Musk made the statement, he says, I think the biggest problem the world will be facing in 20 years is population collapse. And he emphasized the word collapse. Demographics of the world today is most countries around the world have declining populations. Everything in blue is declining population. Everything in, in kind of the, the light salmon color is also declining populations. In fact, over 50% of all the babies born in the world today are being born in six countries. These six countries include Nigeria, Congo, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Angola, and Pakistan. That's five countries in Africa and one in Asia. And they all have access to smartphones. If you think we have a refugee problem today, it's going to get significantly worse or different in the future. By 2050, the most populous country in the world will be India, followed by China, followed by Nigeria. Nigeria will triple its current population right now, and then followed by the U.S. and Pakistan. So we're going to have lots of countries that currently we're not paying attention to suddenly rise in importance because of their population base. Now, the literacy rates in a lot of these countries is very poor, and we're not paying attention to education and schooling in these countries. At the same time, by 2100, over 23 countries are going to lose over half their population, including Korea, uh, including Japan, China, Brazil, Thailand, Italy, Russia, Ukraine, Poland, and Spain. That's just to name a few of them. Lots of changes happening in demographics around the world. COVID-19 is changing the rules. I often get asked the question, well, did you predict the pandemic? And I always say yes, but... The, 
See, as a futurist, we all have a list of, of wildcard scenarios, things that can dramatically go wrong, like get, uh, the Earth getting hit by asteroids and, and uh, major explosions and things like that. So predicting a pandemic was easy, but actually predicting the rule set that went along with it, that was totally different. That was something that nobody was able to anticipate. As an example, a pandemic like this, the disease could be passed from mother to child. It could be passed, it could be more affecting kids than older people. Um, it could be a sexually transmitted disease. It could actually be passed along through your hair follicles. And I like to use that scenario as an example. If it was passed through our hair follicles, that would require everybody shave their head and shave their body. How many people would have complied with that rule? The coronavirus is a massive turning point in history. Now, we've all heard the stories that it's come from the, the Wuhan, the wet markets in Wuhan, or it came from some accident in uh, the research laboratory in Wuhan, or it was actually deliberately set off. I mean, we we're hearing lots of different stories, but whatever actually happened, perception becomes reality. And, and so that's the way people think from then on once they, they hear the story that resonates in their head. So whatever actually happened, and we may never know the real truth behind it, but China set the stage for the rest of the world. When we started seeing the pictures coming out of China, that set the stage for how the rest of the world should react. So we are rebooting society right now. We're rebooting it, and there's lots of pluses and minuses associated with it. As an example, during this time of the great reboot, lots of people have had time to sit back and think. They've been quarantined in their home, and so they're sitting back and thinking about their life and thinking about everything around them. People that are working from home, this is like the ideal setup for a lot of people, but for others, it's less than ideal. If you have kids at home or lots of pets or lots of family and relatives there, it becomes uh, a messy situation at best. Schooling at home, that's become a whole new challenge. Some people like it, but there's a whole lot of people that are, are being challenged in new and different ways. Air pollution in China instantly dropped. On the left, it was before, before the coronavirus, and, and on the right, it's after. Um, this is the same kind of pictures in Italy. A lot fewer car accidents have happened because there's a lot fewer cars on the road for a while. This will be the most expensive crisis in all history. This will be actually more expensive than World War II once we tally up all the totals. Business, businesses were just simply never designed to be totally shut down and restarted a few months later. So it's impossible to have this many top-down decisions without creating a massive number of unintended consequences. We have lots of things that are going to go wrong, and we're going to be cleaning up these messes for literally for years to come. So I'm going to start off here with 10, uh, 10 predictions. The first one is, we are currently experiencing the biggest job transition in all history. See, during this time, people have had time to sit back and think. And they're, they're asking themselves this question, do I really want to be doing the same job moving forward? Or should I be doing something different? And they're all looking for something with more meaning and purpose. And so as a result, we're starting to see lots of transitions, lots of people changing jobs. Some of the hot new, new skills that are in demand are artificial intelligence, problem solving, critical thinking, data analytics, uh, emotional intelligence, social media marketing, lots of companies looking for people with these skills. So contact tracing is quickly becoming the gold standard of the, of, of, for pandemic response. Um, it seems like hearing about contact tracing sounds much better than it actually is. When I arrived here in Seoul, it seemed much messier than I was expecting. So we, we've still got a lot of things to work through on the contact tracing. Contact phobia, uh, people being in fear of being around other people, this is going to create a lingering problem. 
Uh, we have a, a whole young, uh, young people in society today that are just scared of the world. They're scared of other people. They don't want to be around other people. And my guess is we're going to be finding people five years from now that are still tucked away in their house and their home and they don't want to go out. They're still having things delivered to them. Shaking hands has suddenly become a symbol for you're an idiot. Uh, you shouldn't do that. Universities are struggling. Now, this has already been taking place, but the coronavirus has accelerated the, the transition here. Roughly 50% of universities will close by 2030 because of a number of new technologies coming around the corner. Uh, COVID will become the greatest source of conspiracy theories in all history. We're going to see tons of conspiracy theories come out of the woodwork, and, and a lot of them are going to be true, actually. Um, we have lots of companies that are trying to leverage this to their advantage. We have political parties, we have countries trying to leverage it to their advantage. There's, there's lots of push and take on this. And so, as a result, we're going to have tons and tons of conspiracy theories. But many business sectors are struggling. The sharing economy, as an example, is really struggling. Anything to do with large gatherings of people like concerts, festivals, comedy clubs, cru cruises. The cruise industry is really struggling right now. Airline industry uh, has tons and tons of planes that are just sitting on the sidelines right now. Uh, parades are just simply not happening. Professional sports events are happening without anybody in the audience. Um, movies and uh, business expos, these are going to take a long time to recover. But at the same time, there's certain aspects of society that are moving along much quicker. Delivery bots, as an example, they got a, a shot in the arm. Uh, people are suddenly, they want these delivery bots and they want them right now. Electric vehicles, uh, the sales are exploding all, all around the world. And this is happening really quickly. To, to set the stage for this, um, the most successful product launch in all history was in 2016 when Elon Musk introduced the Tesla Model 3. Now this was um, a car that nobody had heard about yet, that knew very little about it. And, but when he introduced it, when he started talking about it, suddenly 450,000 people put $1,000 down to be on a waiting list for a car that they just virtually know nothing about. Now, Tesla has suddenly generated enough interest and enough enthusiasm, so it has become the, the most uh, valuable car company in the world in just a, a few years here. As a result of our transition to electric cars, the internal combustion engine is going to go down. Um, as, as we develop better and better batteries, and by 2025, we'll likely have batteries that will enable you to go 1,500 kilometers on a single charge. And at that point, we'll find it unnecessary to have the very complicated internal combustion engines. And the production of these, these uh, engines will, will all but come to a halt around 2025. Lab-grown meats are taking off like a rocket. Lab-grown meats, uh, and this got a, sh a shot in the arm because of uh, lots of outbreaks that happened at meat production plants. Suddenly, lots of the, the large meat producers have invested in the lab-grown meat uh, process. So these, these are sometimes called clean meats. They are, they're going to be in full production in less than five years. Lots of cities will have them all around. Working remote is here to stay. This is a permanent change. These, these things are, uh, it's, it's hard to unring the bell on some of these. There's, there's pluses and minuses with working from home, but a lot of people like it, and we're getting better tools as we go here. By 2030, the largest company on the internet will be an education-based company that we haven't heard of yet, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a, in a bit. And driverless technology will be the most disruptive technology in all history. Now, when I talk about driverless technology, this autonomous vehicles 
are vehicles that fly in the sky, the vehicles that drive on the ground that go on boats in the ocean, that go in submarines under the ocean. And so we're going to have a whole variety of autonomous technology that's going to change the game. If you can think about a situation where you need something late in the evening, you can just summon a vehicle to come to your home in the evening. You don't have to get dressed and go to the store. You can just walk out, uh, take what you want, and it'll automatically charge you. And it's not just retail, retail stores. It's also driverless offices, driverless classrooms, driverless training centers. Um, every business you can possibly think of will, will go into an autonomous setting sometime in the very near future. And this is going to create tons of talent shortages. So if you think about digital twin technology, digital twin technology is the ability to take and put sensors all around something like a giant tractor or a cruise ship or uh, a turbine in a power plant. And using these sensors, you can monitor it, monitor it from the other side of the world. And you can detect when things are about to go wrong, and you can send people in there to replace parts and to make corrections before things go, turn into a disastrous situation. Now, the next generation of digital twins is something we call remote robotics. Now, remote robotics means that you'll be able to actually operate the equipment from the other side of the world. So at what point will the operator no longer be needed in the vehicle like in a tractor or a combine or a harvester, or how much longer will we still need pilots in airplanes? How much longer will we still need a captain on a cargo ship? We can have these autonomous vehicles running all around the world without people inside. And then how long before the digital twin technology is common with humans? This is an important question because doctors will soon be able to monitor people from a long ways away. So you don't actually have to go to the doctor for them to look at you. They can tell through your digital twin. Healthcare is quickly transitioning from, a tech, from an industry driven by pharmaceuticals to an industry driven by data. So will the human genome just become another programming language? There are several companies that think so. We're looking at lots of interesting breakthroughs because of this. So Kevin Kelly, one of my colleagues, he has this famous quote. He says that the future happens very slowly and then all at once. And we're starting to see this all at once thing taking place right now. So quantum computing is one of the things that just kind of crashed onto the scene here just in the past few months. Quantum computing... Um, is something that we don't understand too much about. But in the past, computing was always done with ones and zeros. And quantum computing actually goes with probabilities, uh, probability of ones and zeros. So it can range anywhere in between. It's much more complicated than that. But in October of last year, Google claimed to have achieved quantum supremacy. Now, quantum supremacy is a, a mathematical... Um, it, it was a challenge that was put out there by a group of mathematicians that they said, if you can do this, this, this will give you quantum supremacy. And Google claims that they accomplished it, even though it was a rather meaningless accomplishment. So they used their, their quantum computer called Sycamore, and it took around 200 seconds for them to complete a task that was anticipated would take 10,000 years for traditional supercomputers. But IBM looked at that same problem a few days later, and they worked on it, and they said, well, hold, hold on, we, we were able to complete that in two and a half days with our supercomputer. But there's a big difference between 200 seconds and two and a half days. So the big question becomes, was this Google Sputnik moment? Was this the game-changing uh, uh, event that's going to change quantum computing for good. Maybe. So the question is, is, is this equal to the Wright Brothers' first flight? Is it equal to Tim Berners-Lee posting the first website? Is it equal to Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov or Steve Jobs introducing the first iPhone? There's, there's a challenging world 
for quantum computing that still lies ahead. As an example, with quantum computing, uh, we still don't have the reliability, the stability. We don't even know what the good programming languages are for quantum computing. We don't have database structures figured out yet, and just this overall path to implementation is, is pretty crude. But when we can apply a million times more computing power to a problem, logically that makes sense that we should be able to find cures for every disease, we should be able to find cures for human aging, longevity should go up exponentially, space travel and colonization uh, to other planets should be possible, unlimited free energy, well, maybe. It's, it's not a direct replacement for traditional computers, so. There's a big downside to quantum computing, though, at the same time. Suddenly, all encryption systems that we have today become breakable. We have to transition to quantum level encryption sometime in less than five years. That's happening very fast. All cryptocurrency that's, that's still out there can be mined instantly, at least in its current configuration. Blockchain becomes a broken technology, again, in its current configuration. Stock markets no longer work. Uh, gambling industry suddenly breaks, breaks apart. All of these things go haywire unless we make changes to them. So Google's quantum supremacy triggered an inst instant talent shortage. So this, this is real interesting because as soon as they announced quantum supremacy, then suddenly all these ads started showing up because it became this mad race to see who could dominate the quantum computing world. So artificial intelligence and education are, in, are on a convergent course here, and this changes the way education is going to be done in the future. In 2012, I was giving a talk in Istanbul at a TEDx conference, and I was talking a lot about teacherless education. Afterwards, one of the executives from Google came up to me, and he says, at Google, we're very interested in teacherless education because we want to educate Africa, and teachers don't want to go to Africa. Now, this is a very brief encounter, but he was absolutely right. Teachers don't want to go to Africa. And it was a very revealing moment for me because, no, teachers don't want to go to Siberia. Uh, they don't want to go to Bangladesh. They don't want to go to uh, lots of places in the world. And so, in fact, we're, we have a global teacher shortage of 69 million teachers right now. And 23% of all children do not go to any school whatsoever. In fact, if we continue to have to insert a teacher between us and everything we have to learn in the future, we can't possibly learn things fast enough. The role of education is changing. It's no longer possible to anticipate the needs of business four to five years in advance. We are currently preparing students for jobs that don't exist, using technology that hasn't been invented to solve problems we don't even know are problems yet. The average person entering the workforce in 2030, a young person entering the workforce 10 years from now, had better anticipate rebooting their career eight to 10 times throughout their life. There's going to be lots of retraining along the way. So with artificial intelligence, we're standing on the brink of a technological revolution. Lots of these sciences have been worked on for decades, and they're all finally coming together, and big things are starting to happen. Some of the early adopters of artificial intelligence are healthcare, driverless vehicles, Internet of Things, 3D printing, Drone technology, all of these things are using AI technology in a big way. But the human race has an unwritten mandate to pass knowledge from one generation to the next. <coughs> the tools that we're using today to pass information from one generation to the next aren't good enough. Libraries, we love libraries, but they're just simply not enough. They're not good enough. Colleges simply are not fast enough. It, it's a very slow process to learn something in college. Technology has a poor interface for the human brain. 
but changes are happening very quickly. So things, things are coming along very fast. One of the big, big changes right now is that certifications are now competing directly with college degrees and companies are paying attention. So as an example, there, right now there's a huge demand for cloud management certification. And these certifications can be achieved in a shorter period of time than a college degree. And they actually pay more money. There's a huge demand for cybersecurity certifications. And in the future, there's going to be a huge demand for quantum computing certifications. If we look at the world of accomplishments, there's, there's lots of interesting things that can happen that currently are not. So unlike an apprenticeship, an apprenticeship is where you work with a master uh, craftsman or a master technician and you learn the trade. But if you go to uh, virtually none of the efforts going into achieving a college degree produce anything that's noteworthy. There's virtually nobody that walks, out of, walks away from college and says, wow, this is what I accomplished, and are able to show something that other people can actually uh, value as well. Yet there's, there's lots of accomplishments in the world that are the equivalent to college degrees, uh, that do have that, uh, that accomplishment. So as an example, if you wrote a book, that might be the equivalent of a college degree. If it was a bestseller, it would be even better. If you designed a video game, that might be the equivalent of a college degree. If it was a bestseller, it would be even better. The same with inventing a product, or producing a documentary, or launching a new business or founding a movement, starting a new movement, or producing a podcast series, or just becoming an expert on some new topic. All of these things have the, the ability for you to show the world what you've accomplished. Now, if you had, as an example, an AI coach system that went along with the process, that would be vastly different. So at the Da Vinci Institute that I run, we, we play around with lots of different scenarios. We look at these different possibilities of how things can happen. And one of the scenarios we've been playing around with is this idea of gamifying education with what we call microcredits. Um, so microcredits will help credential every, everyday learning activities. So as an example, if we if we figure that 100 microcredits will equal one college credit, then we'll have some sort of a formula for making the transition. So if uh, the average person in the United States today is consuming information 12 hours and seven minutes every day. That's, it's similar in, in lots of other developed countries. Um, 12 hours and seven minutes. A lot of it is listening to music, we're watching television, we're, we're listening to podcasts and, uh, and other things. In the middle of it, though, we're consuming lots of valuable information. So if, as an example, you read a book and you took a test, you got 14.7 microcredits. If you watch a movie, you take a test, you get 3.2 microcredits. You listen to a podcast or take an online course, and, and you take a test, then suddenly you get 6.8 microcredits. It's the same with participating in a public forum, listening to a TED Talk, watching a documentary, or doing a training video. There's lots of activities where you're actually learning, and is it possible to credential each of these, these activities? <coughs> so what if we rewrite the rules for achievement? Because um, right now, there's, there's a very archaic, old set of rules for achieving things. So right now, the highest level of achievement in academia is a PhD. If you get a PhD, a doctor's degree, um, that's the highest level you can achieve. <coughs> but what if we took the lid off of that? What if there was 200 levels above a PhD? What if it was possible for you to achieve something way beyond a PhD? Um, and, and we had the, the process for doing that. Now, another scenario that we've been playing around with is this idea of a podcast college. <coughs> so what if, what if we were able to, um, right now there are tons of podcasts out there, 850,000 podcasts, 30 million episodes 
already exist. Uh, now, if we had an AI system that would go in there and actually listen to all of these and create a taxonomy, so this one you should listen to first and this one and that one, and then having a combination of video podcasts along with audio podcasts along with other types of training and courses, and suddenly <coughs> you could create some sort of a course methodology that would actually get you um, to a skill level that's unlike anything that we can achieve today. See, our education system today has been built around just-in-case thinking, which ends up being a poor fit for our just-in-time business world. So lots of the things we learn in school are just in case you're going to need it in the future. It's not something that you're going to apply right now. And very little of what we learn in college ever gets put to practical use in the business world. If we change our thinking about this, and if we apply AI to teacher bots that we interact with on a personal basis, the new game becomes to find the fastest way to teach students whatever they need at the moment that they need it. Over time, these AIs will learn every student's proclivity. They'll learn their idiosyncrasies, their preferred tools, personal reference points, and how to keep them engaged in learning even in the face of distractions. It'll quickly learn what skills you're deficient in, what skills you're proficient in, what's needed to bring you up to speed to learn what you need for this new task. It'll learn how and when to schedule your training and whether whether you've mastered the topic. So it'll learn when things are working, when things are not working, and it'll learn when you've mastered a new skill. Throughout this training, individuals will be learning faster and faster and faster. Maybe two times faster, four times faster, even ten times faster. Learning the equivalent of an entire college degree in one month may be possible sometime in the future. And that's why I've made this prediction that by 2030, the largest company on the internet will be an education-based company that we haven't heard of yet. Because this is the largest opportunity, at least in my mind, that nobody has quite cracked the code for. And this is right around the corner. There are tons of companies, I've heard from lots of these people, tons of companies that are working on this. And uh, they're all coming up to, to me and saying, hey, we're that company. And I keep saying, well, just show me. Now, once this happens, this is going to open the door, this will open the floodgates for tons of micro-industries, lots of new startups, AI-enhanced human app builders, AI training systems for business, traffic control systems, warning systems, just so much more. And the, the job market's going to explode as well because we'll have future jobs for self-assessment auditors, data contextualists, deficiency analyzers, school designers, policy advisors, career transitionists, goal counselors, and, and much, much more. All right, let's, let's transition a little bit to specifically about the, the future of the Korean Peninsula. By 2060... Over half the population will be over 60 here. Only 20% will be under 30. That's a, that's a huge difference based on today's birth rate. Very few workers will be left to pay taxes to support health care for the elderly and buy, buy the, the things that are being sold in the marketplace. So there's a lot of hard choices moving forward. One option is to have more kids or you can increase immigration, or you can increase life expectancy. If you cure human aging, then people will no longer die. You can employ more robots, you can use surrogate parenting, you can wait and see what happens, or you can stage some sort of reunification with North Korea. Again, this is another one of those crazy scenarios we work through, and it raises lots of questions. Now, I'm not going to say this is going to happen, but this is an interesting scenario. The year is 2022, two years in the future. The Helsinki, the Helsinki Committee on Human Rights decides to hold a global election to let the people of the world decide on the reunification of North and South Korea. 
So it no longer just becomes a Korea issue, it becomes a global issue, and everybody in the world gets to decide. With the introduction of a secure new web-based voting system, they asked the world uh, to decide who the winner should be. And with several Nobel Peace Prize winners backing the effort, the election gains instant global attention. Lots of people suddenly start paying attention to this. Even though it's a rather meaningless thing, it becomes one of the world's first global elections, and interesting things can happen when you change the game. The goal is to promote human rights around the world and to promote peace in the process. So the way, the way it works is this gets announced 60 days before the election. It's a 24-hour election process so people around the world can vote on it. And votes get cast through every computer, through every tablet, computer, smartphones, um, every device possible. And so then, when the elect after the election happens, the winner gets announced. Um, 960 million votes are cast from 157 different countries. And reun reunification wins by a landslide, and suddenly, this becomes a new global mandate. Now, what does that mean? Being a new global mandate changes kind of the narrative. It changes it gives new type of authority, it gives new cloud, it gives new ways of arguing this, this whole process. Reunification, in my mind, has been long overdue. Um, you know, you've always been in search of the first snowflake to cause the avalanche. You haven't quite found it yet. But there's, there's tons of different ways the relationship between North and South Korea could change. You could become friendly neighbors, you could become trading partners. There's lots of ways that it could change without actually becoming one combined country. But again, it's long overdue, and the difference is staggering between the two countries. Now, there's things that could be done to trigger reunification. Certainly some uh, technology symbolizing a dominance of power on one side versus the other, creating really tall uh, lookout stations that are visibly obvious from the other side, even having flying security guards that fly along the border become a vis visual symbol for how backwards they are on the other side. But this could be a great awakening. There this could be involve religious triggers, political triggers, natural disaster, technological trigger, personal awakening. There's, there's lots of things that happen in the minds of people when we change the narrative. And changing the narrative is, a, is an important part of the equation. So in my mind, re reunification is going to happen. Um, it'll be a peaceful but tr difficult transition. And for North Korea, the, the great age of unlearning begins because they have to suddenly forget all of the things they've been taught. There's, there's five reasons for this in my mind. Isolated states never last. Communication technology finds a way. It's kind of like water. Water seeps in wherever it wants to. Communication technology finds a way. It does that as well. And technology is creating this massive gulf between the, the informed and the uninformed. And it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like that, the same water uh, analogy where it seeps in and information will flow to where it's needed. China and Russia, their support for North Korea is dwindling. And weapon systems will soon be able to target any individual anywhere, anytime. Now, this is an important thing, because if suddenly you have a global mandate to change the equation, then you can take out a few people um, with new weapons. And I'm not, I'm not saying you should do this. I'm just saying that it will be possible in the future. For people all over the planet, COVID-19 crisis is a deeply personal experience. Governments are now exerting far more power and control than ever before in history. We're going to see lots of short-term deglobalization and flying into, flying international, uh, it became very obvious to me what it was like um, before going through an international terminal at an airport and what it's like today. And it is not the same. It's going to take a long time for international travel to recover. 
as a result, we're going to see lots of short-term protectionism. Um, people are going to want to protect their own turf. Lots of shift to local manufacturing, supply chains, stockpiling of of special products, tight controls over sensitive exports. So society is changing faster today than ever before in history. And we're actually looking to the storytellers to help guide our thinking. Now, we don't think about it this way, but the storytellers really set the stage for everything else. So pay close attention. Our, our definition of heroes, success, and achievement is changing. So are our thoughts on villains, virtue, passion, and our quest for accomplishment. We're desperately seeking new forms of leadership, new decision-making, ways of setting priorities, and ways of getting things done. We no longer feel comfortable with our old sense of morality, purpose, and relationships. Our global consciousness has changed, and this is the perfect time for a new breed of storyteller to pave the way. So never again. We live in, a, in great fear of the unseeable, unknowable, unmanageable forces of nature. After this, the people of the world will demand never again. They don't want to ever go through this ever again. So how do we pandemic-proof the world so this never happens again? Well, some of, some of the thoughts on pandemic-proofing the world, is that even possible? Uh, step one, we would start controlling the meat supply. That was logically the culprit this time around. If we control the meat supply, that becomes a big difference. We can eliminate the wildlife markets. We can prohibit the sale of raw meat that hasn't been either irradiated or cleansed with some cleansing process like UV lighting. We can make the transition to lab-grown meats, or at least partially that. We can make the transition to, to plant-based meat substitutes. Step two, we can dramatically reduce deforestation. We can actually start implementing reforestation programs to restore some of the buffer zones between the habitats of wildlife and the domestic livestock. Step three, we can develop augmented reality technology capable of scanning for viruses. So when a crowd of people is coming in, we can scan through the crowd and we can see who's infected and who isn't. There's lots of other options that can be considered as well. Digital tattoos for monitoring blood, odorometers for monitoring the smells, because there's a distinct difference in smell as a result of this. Antivirus skin coatings that we developed, uh, actually inventing self-disinfecting houses, um, and using CRISPR technology. CRISPR technology opens the door for tons of different opportunities. <clears throat> so what's the cost of pandemic proofing? The estimate is that it would cost roughly $30 billion a year globally to pandemic proof the world. And at this, during this crisis, we're roughly spending $20 trillion, so many multiples of that. So it looks like a bargain if we'd want to go down this path. We're entering a period of unprecedented opportunity. So why is this so important? Because humanity will change more in the next 20 years than in all human history. At the same time, our risk factors go up. We create more and more breaking points along the way, and things can go wrong. And our children's children, who haven't even been born yet, they're counting on you. They're counting on the people watching this broadcast to make great decisions. As Steve Jobs said, is right now is one of those moments when you are influencing the future. But sometimes our best efforts just look a lot like this. Yeah, pretty much just like that. We all crash and burn. Uh, for any of you that are interested in the books that I've written, this is my, my last book, Epiphany Z. It's actually been translated into Korean, in Chinese, and in English. And if you're interested, we have a, a newsletter that comes out once a week called Foresight Journaling. And if you want more information about what we do at the Da Vinci Institute, just sign up for our free newsletter, our Future Trends Report. And I thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Frey. Please give him another big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.